Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to the Novartis Q3 2022 results release conference call and live webcast. Please note that during the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode and the conference is being recorded. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions by pressing star 1 and 1 at any time during the conference. Please limit yourself to one question and return to the queue for any follow-up. A recording of the conference call, including the Q&A session, will be available on our website shortly after the call ends. With that, I would like to hand over to Mr. Samir Shah, Global Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you again for taking the time to participate in Novartis' Quarter 3 conference call. Before we start, just a quick reminder of the safe harbor. The information presented today contains forward-looking statements that involve known and unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors. These may cause the actual results to be materially different from any future results, performance, or achievements expressed or implied by such statements. For a description of some of these factors, please refer to the company's Form 20F and its most recent quarterly results on Form 6K that respectively were filed with and furnished to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. And with that, I'll hand across to Vas. Thank you, Samir, and thanks, everyone, for joining uh, today's conference call. Uh, moving to the first slide, you take a couple of slides forward. Uh, Novartis delivered solid quarter three performance really across all of our core value drivers. From a growth standpoint, group sales were up 4% in constant currencies. That was driven both by solid performance and IM at 4%. As well as in Sandoz, U.S. IM sales were up 8% consistent with our strategy to continue to improve our position in the U.S. market. From a productivity standpoint, group core operating income was up 5%, again driven by IM, which was up 7%. We also uh, had uh, continued our, our margin progression with a 1% uh, percentage point improvement. Our savings from our SG&A program are on track, and Harry will cover that in a bit, uh, bit more detail. From an innovation standpoint, we had some important events, particularly the approval of Pluvicto with a positive opinion uh, in, uh, in Europe with the, from the CHMP, and the readout we had uh, and announced earlier this week of a Tacopan in PNH across uh, two uh, superiority endpoints versus anti c and I'll go through that in a bit more detail. Lastly, and on an ESG front, uh, we had an important uh, announcement with respect to our uh, work with the medicines patent pool, as well as two uh, additional important milestones for uh, two uh, development programs in hydrox with hydroxyurea in sickle cell disease, as well as in malaria. Moving to the next slide. The performance in the quarter was really driven by Entresto, Casimta, Kiskali, and Pluvicto. And you can see the growth here for each of these brands. Intresto continues its strong trajectory, Kasimta and Kaskali performing well, and Pluvicto in its first full quarter in the launch uh, also performing very well in its early days. We also saw good performance across some of the other brands, and we'll come to that uh, brand by brand in the upcoming section. Moving to slide six. One important element of our story is our ability to make our six key in-market growth drivers into multi-billion dollar medicines. And we stayed on track with respect to that to really uh, continue our confidence in our midterm growth outlook. Those six brands now account for 33% of IM sales, and they were growing 23% in the quarter. And as noted, both Semblex and Pluvicto now are off to a good start and could one day be added to that list of uh, six brands to also be potential multi-billion dollar brands in the future, depending on how readouts go in the earlier lines. Moving to the next slide. Now we'll just take a walk through each of the individual brands, and I'll give you some of the key highlights from the quarter. Cosentix showed steady growth uh, in the quarter. You can see 7% growth uh, in quarter three. Uh, we were maintaining our competitive position in our three ge core geographies. We have over 875,000 patients now treated. In the U.S., we saw solid volume growth, but we also saw the impact of increased revenue deductions, particularly in Medicaid and 340B segments, relative to a, a previous uplift we saw in revenue deductions in the previous year. Uh, that's something we'll continue to we expect to continue in, the, in quarter four. Now, with respect to Europe, we maintain our leadership position amongst originator biologics in psoriasis and spondyloarthritis. 
Future growth drivers for Cosentix to get to that $7 billion peak sales will be driven by our continued uh, expansion in China. Notably, in China at the moment, we do face headwinds with the um, ongoing lockdowns, but we continue to expect China to be an important part of our story. Hydradenitis superativa is now filed, uh, submitted, filed in both FDA and email. I'll tell you a little bit more about why we feel like we have a good op- opportunity with this indication. We expect to submit our IV regulatory file in quarter four. And we also continue to advance our life cycle management program across additional indications, including giant cell arteritis, where we saw pretty, pretty solid phase 2B data. Now, moving to slide eight, Entresto continues to strongly across all geographies, 31% growth in the quarter. You can see here the weekly TRXs continue to set record after record, uh, really a strong performance. In the U.S., but, but also around the world, we now have over 8 million patients on therapy, uh, accelerating momentum in the U.S., strong demand in Europe. When you look at the future growth drivers of the brand, it's worth noting that only a third of eligible HEFREF patients are currently on treatment in the G7. And there's a strong profile we continue to build in clinical and real world, world, real world settings in heart failure. We have guidelines that continue to support the use of Entresto and HEF-REF and also support its use in half pest And we're also seeing good demand from the hypertension indications we were able to secure in Japan and in China. Then moving to slide nine, Zolgensma had a little bit of a challenge quarter. We now are predominantly seeing, uh, grow, we're seeing demand from the incident population. Both U.S. and ex-U.S. are shifted to an incident patient population. Uh, year to date, we still have double digit growth in, in incident patients treated, and we've exceeded 2,500 patients treated worldwide. Uh, going forward, what will be key for us is to continue to expand into new markets. Foundation, it's a foundational treatment, as you all know, for type 1 in newborns. We are approved in 45 countries, and we have access negotiations ongoing now in 10 plus markets, including some important markets such as Brazil. We also continue to work to increase newborn screening rates uh, to 35%, above 35% in Europe and hopefully get over time to the rates that we see in the U.S. where we're close to 98% of newborn screened. Taken together, we expect Zolgensma to, we continue to expect Zolgensma to reach the $1.5 to $2 billion sales level in the IV indication alone. But getting beyond that sales level will require uh, expansion into the intrathecal indication in the 2- to 18-year-old patient segment, where the STEER study is continuing to enroll, and we also have the STRENGTH study looking at the IV utilization in that indication starting in Q4 2022. Now, moving to slide 10, Kitkali had a a really strong quarter across all regions with 49% growth on the quarter. Uh, You can see, importantly, in the middle panel of the slide, the trend break we've had with respect to NBRX share in the U.S. in the metastatic population, where we've been able to climb over the course of this year from 12 to 13 percent to now 26 percent exiting in August. That's really on the back of the strong data that we have with respect to OS across all of the metastatic lines. Um, it's the only CDK46 uh, with overall survival benefit across three phase three studies. We also have strong data with respect to quality of life. We've launched a head-to-head study, the Harmonia study versus Ibrance, to further solidify that profile. And the Natalie study continues. We have not had any feedback yet from the steering committee with respect to the uh, first interim analysis. And when that feedback becomes available, if it uh, indicates uh, uh, any action on our part, we'll, of course, inform the market. Moving to slide 11. Now, Cosenta had strong sales growth as well in the quarter, driven by its U.S. launch momentum, 172%. You can see here uh, on its launch trajectory, really all of the key metrics are trending in a favorable direction. TRX, 131%. NVRX, 47%. Versus a market, notably, that's declining 20%. We are up to 30% NVRX share in B-cell, amongst B-cell therapies and MS in the U.S., with a goal to reach 50% uh, share. Um, we're adding 100 new riders per month. Our initiation programs with our patient uh, patient hub are ex- performing extremely well. And we also released new four-year data in recently diagnosed and treatment-naive symptom patients that support its use in earlier stages in RMS disease. 
so really good trajectory here and an opportunity for us now to also accelerate our efforts outside of the United States to bring this medicine to more multiple sclerosis patients around the world. Now moving to the next slide. Now with Lecvio, as we've noted, this is a steady build over the course of 2023 and the first half of 2024. Last quarter, we highlighted that we have good, uh, good data or good positioning right now with respect to market access with 70% of lives covered at or near uh, the full label. Uh, the vast majority of patients uh, are able to access the medicine with a low copay. And now what we're doing is step-by-step -step expanding HCP adoption with now 4,800 or so physicians that have been able to initiate a patient on Lectio. What is critical now for us is to guide these uh, physicians through the process so that uh, they're able to get their patients on board, they're able to see how buy and bill work, and importantly, they're also able to see the impact of the medicine on lowering LDL for their patients. What we find is in physicians that have gone through that process and have ultimately seen the impact on their patients, over 80% of patient, uh, physicians are pleased by the process and are pleased by the clinical and safety profile of the medicine. We just need to get more physicians through that process so you can see some of the other data on the on the right hand side. We have a free trial offer as well that's launched that seems strong uptake. So we'll continue to work through the hurdles step by step. I think the right things are happening, but again, this is going to take time, and we really think it's a mid year next year before you would expect to see any further acceleration beyond the linear path that we're on at the moment. Then moving to the next slide. So Victor, as I noted in my opening comments, is off to a strong start in the U.S. We're seeing very rapid launch uptake for this brand in the third, fourth line uh, castrate-resistant prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer segment, $80 million in share. We're already up to 14% NBRX share in the post-taxing setting. We have 120 centers actively ordering, uh, and we're really focused on servicing those centers in an outstanding way. 75% of insured lives are covered, and we have a permanent A code now in effect uh, as of October. Now, looking ahead, as we prepare for additional data and ex potential expansion of the indications for this medicine, we're expanding the number of treatment centers. We expect to, over time, get to 350 to 400 centers. We're significantly increasing our manufacturing capacity. And we have our Italian site, Evria, online, and Milburn and Indianapolis are planned for 2023. I mentioned already the positive CHMP opinion, and we're on track for the readout of PSMA-4 before the end of this year, and PSMA addition. And of note, PSMA-4, our current assessment is this would cover all pre-taxane metastatic patients, eliminating the need for one of the additional studies we had previously expected uh, to be running in, in, in that setting. And in PSMA addition, in the hormone-sensitive setting, we would expect to read out in 2024. So more to come, but overall a solid launch so far with Fluvicto. Then moving to the next slide and looking at Semblix. Semblix uh, also continuing a solid launch momentum through quarter three. You can see $41 million in sales, 13% total overall patient share in the uh, third line setting, and 39% third line new patient share. Uh, that new patient share growth has slowed a bit as we would have expected as we need patients to switch off of uh, therapies that they're currently on uh, to be typically moved to, to Semblix. Looking ahead, we expect, we've had the accelerated approval converted to a regular approval based on 96-week data. The global rollout is ongoing. And importantly, our phase three study is enrolling ahead of plan. Right now, we forecast a readout expected on the first Please continue to stand by. Your conference will resume shortly.
Thank you for your patience. Please continue to stand by. Your conference will begin shortly. Hi, operator. This is Vas. We're back. Thank you, sir. You are live. I, I think we were just trying to work out. So I think uh, I'll just step back, operator, uh, to one slide previously. So when I talk about moving to first on assembly. Um, which would be on slide 14. Um, we continue to see strong lo launch momentum uh, where we have Q3 sales driven uh, in part by uh, <clears throat> Q3 sales were a 40, 41 million and we had a 13% um, patient share uh, in, in the third line setting. NBRX share is at 39%. Um, and overall, we expect Semblix, the, the critical element now will be moving forward, our ability to move into the earlier lines the study is enrolling ahead of plan, and uh, we'll provide further updates, but right now we forecast the second half of 2024 outlook for assembly. Now, turning to some of the clinical data we had in the quarter, Cosentix, we had previously top-lined our data, 16-week data in hydroadenitis uh, superativa. Uh, now we have the 52-week data in-house. And just to remind everyone that it's a high unmet need a patient population, one of the more common dermatological conditions that dermatologists see. 95% of eligible, eligible patients are not on a biologic to date today, and 50% of biologic treated patients lose the response over time. So there's definitely a need for a better therapy that can sustain its efficacy over time. With the Sunshine and Sunrise data set, we were able to collect data both at the 16-week and 52-week time period We've already demonstrated data that showed a rapid relief from pain flares and lesion, but now we have data in-house that suggests that we have a unique benefit to sustain the response over 52 weeks, along with a favorable safety profile. So we'll look forward to sharing that data. We have filed, as I mentioned already, with the regulators, and overall we're hopeful that this can be a key growth driver for Cosentix over the coming years. Now moving to the next slide. Uh, earlier this week, we announced the release of the Aptacopan Phase three data in PNH. And this is a medicine we believe can become a pipeline and a pill uh, over time with a range of indications we're currently developing the medicine for. As a reminder, we are in, uh, we read out the PNH Phase three with an additional Phase three upcoming, the Appoint PNH study. We're in Phase three studies in IGAN, C3G, and atypical hemolo hemolytic uremic syndrome. And we have a range of additional indications currently ongoing. As a reminder, the applied PNH study uh, related to the treatment of patients who had refractory anemia uh, after treatment with an anti-C5, and the APPOINT study is in treatment-naive patients uh, to anti-C5 antibodies, also uh, expected to read out in 2022. Now, looking on the next slide, slide 17, to the applied PNH study specifically, this is a study uh, as I mentioned, patients were on C5 therapy for up to eight weeks. They then switched to, a, if they had refractory anemia, anemia um, that demonstrated hemo, uh, hemoglobin levels of less than 10 grams per deciliter, they were randomized to either receive iptacopan or an anti-C5 therapy for 24 weeks. And after that period of time, they would continue on iptacopan for the extension period. We demonstrated superiority for both endpoints, and I would say clinically meaningful superiority on both endpoints in terms of proportion of patients at greater than 2 grams and greater than 12 grams per DL. We uh, are, have submitted this data or plan to submit this data to an upcoming medical congress where we would share not only the magnitude of the effect in the primary endpoints, but also secondary end endpoints which cover uh, uh, secondary endpoints including transfusion independence, quality of life, overall response rate, as well as other measures. So moving to the next slide, just as a reminder, our goal with this medicine is to be a first-line therapy for all patients with PNH. Uh, and that is the positioning that we plan to achieve both through our labeling and through the launch process. Uh, 10 to 20 cases per million is the current estimate of PNH with an, a current prevalence in the United States of 4 to 6,000. In the population of the current study that we just read out, about 40% of patients remain anemic with hemoglobin less than uh, 10 grams per deciliter on anti-C5 therapies. It's also worth noting that a, a higher proportion of patients 
have some level anemia, some level of fatigue or other clinical manifestations of the disease. So the unmet need is significant even in the case of anti-T5 treatments. And 50% of patients, of these patients receive transfusions. We believe that Paclopan presents a unique opportunity to address both intra and extravascular hemolysis, potential for lower transfusion requirements and improvements in the quality of life. We think the oral administration in this setting makes a lot of sense, uh, and then we can talk more about that in the Q&A. And we believe that this, uh, there is a potential for this medicine to have a broad first-line label. So moving to the next slide, lastly, before handing it over to Harry, Sanders delivered another solid quarter of growth. Uh, and you can see the, the growth rates here where uh, we once again uh, had 4% sales growth. This was driven uh, in part by Europe, uh, but particularly by our performance in the rest of world markets where we had double-digit growth. This is the fourth consecutive quarter of solid top-line growth for Sandoz, despite having to overcome the impact of Russia and Ukraine and absorbing inflation and other headwinds. We've revised the full-year guidance upwards, and Harry will speak more about that. And we want to just remind again that biosimilars are the key future growth driver of the business. We had the file acceptance of adalumumab high concentration and natalizumab in the quarter, as well as a positive phase three result for denosumab uh, as well from the biosimilars unit. So uh, with that, I will, and we're on track, I should say, as well for the spin, plan spin uh, in the second half of next year. So with that, I'll hand it over to Harry. Yeah, thank you, Bas. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. I'm now going to walk you through some of the financials for the third quarter and the first nine months of the year. And as always, my comments refer to growth rates and constant currencies. This is, of course, particularly important given the significant currency fluctuations we all see, and so we believe it offers a better view of the underlying operational performance. On slide 21, uh, this shows the usual summary of our operational performance for the third quarter and the first nine months. We have also provided growth rates with and without the impact of the prior year Roche income to allow a better understanding of the underlying business. As you can see, we maintained our growth momentum in the quarter, with quarter three sales growing plus 4% and cooperative income plus 5%. With sales growth driven by our major innovative medicines brands, in particular Andresto, Kisim, and Kiskali. Higher sales were also reflected in higher core operating income growth, and inflationary headwinds have been offset by productivity efforts. Operating and net income declined in the quarter, mainly due to higher impairments of about half a billion and higher restructuring cost of half, uh, about 0.4 billion euros per year, which were mainly due to the implementation of our previously announced streamlined organization model. Core EPS grew 1%. However, if you exclude the impact of the prior year Roche income, core EPS would have grown 10%. Free cash flow in the quarter was strong with 4.2 billion, but declined 6% in US dollars versus prior year with a significant impact from currencies. Turning to the first nine months, we delivered a stronger, a slightly stronger growth year to date with sales growing 5% and core operating income growing 6%. Core EPS in the first nine months grew 11%, excluding the roll stake impact. On the next slide, I would like to drill down, as usual, into the performance by division. So for Q3, Innovative Medicine's top line grew 4% and the bottom line 7%, resulting in an improvement of the core margin of 100 basis points to 38.1%. Sandoz net sales also grew 4%, although core operating income decreased 5%, mainly due to increased M&S investments versus a quite low prior year base and prior year small divestment gains. This was reflected in the core margin, which decreased to approximately 22% of sales, which is also in line with the year-to-date core margin for Sandoz. Overall, for the first nine months, we saw a slightly stronger sales performance for both divisions, IM sales grew 5% and core operating income 6%, and for Sando sales grew 6% and 5% on the bottom line, benefiting from a strong cough and cold season, return towards normal business dynamics, 
and a low prior year base in the first half of the year. Our year-to-date core margin improved by 50 basis points for IM, which drove then also the 50 basis points improvements for the group. Now on to slide uh, 23. On the next slide, a reminder of the cost impacts of our simplified, organ simplified organizational model. We continue to expect to deliver 1.5 billion US dollars in structural cost savings to be fully embedded by 2024. And as a reminder, we also expect one-time restructuring costs to be one to 1.2 times this annual structural savings. And for year to date this year, we um, have around 0 0.8 billion in restructuring costs related to the new streamlined model and expect approximately a total of 1 billion for the full year of restructuring costs on this uh, topic. The rest of the one-time restructuring costs we anticipate will largely fall into 2023. This year, we do expect to see some savings, as you can see here illustrative on the chart, but the overall impact um, will be minimal, as this will offset higher energy costs and inflationary pressures. All of these elements are, of course, part of our 2022 guidance. As a reminder, a part of the 1.5 billion savings we expect to be reinvested into our pipeline, and a significant part will contribute to achieve our approximately 40% plus margin target in the 2027 plus time frame. Now turning to page uh, 24. Within the divisions, we expect innovative medicine sales growing mid single digits and core operating income growing mid to high single digits ahead of sales. The anticipated innovative medicines core margin increase should be driven by the expected continued good top line momentum and the continuation of our productivity programs, including the new streamlined organization model. For Sandos, the performance year to date allows us to upgrade sales and core operating income guidance and sales are now expected to grow low to mid single digit, revised upward from low single digit, and core operating income is now expected to grow low single digit, revised upward from broadly in line. For the group, we confirm our overall guidance. We continue to expect both top and bottom line to grow mid single digit in 2022. And as you have seen from our year to date results, we are quite on track and very much on track to deliver on that guidance. The key assumption for this guidance is that we see continuing return to normal global prescribing behaviors and healthcare systems, and that no Sandoz started LAR generic would enter the US in 2022. The guidance also takes into account the entry of Jalenia generics that have now launched in the US, for your information, Jalinia US sales in quarter three were 326 million. On slide 25, I would like to provide an update on the other key financial elements of our expected core net income performance. As indicated on the Q2 call, we expect core net financial expenses to be slightly lower than in 2021, around 100 to 150 million favorable versus 2021, revised from broadly in line versus 2021. And this change is mainly due to the higher financial income from reinvesting the proceeds of the Roche divestment and increased interest income for deposits. And the 2022 core tax rate is now expected to be around 16.5%, revised from the 17 to 17.5% range. This is mainly driven by favorable change in the geographical profit mix. On slide 26, I want to provide an update on expected currency impacts if currencies stay at current levels. Obviously, currency Impacts are significant this year, given the strength in U.S. dollar against many, if not all, currencies. For quarter four, if currencies stay as they are now, we expect sales to be impacted by a negative 9% and core operating income by negative 11% points. For the full year, we estimate the impact on the top line to be negative 7 points and on the bottom line, negative 8 points. Now, into 23, 
we would expect the sales to be impacted by negative 4 and the bottom line negative 5% versus 2022. As a reminder, as currencies move quite dynamically, we update currency impacts every month on our website. And with that, I hand back to Lars. Thank you, Harry. So moving to slide 28, just as a reminder at our recent Meet the Management, we articulated our new Novartis strategy, high-value medicines, greatest disease burdens through technology, leadership in R&D and novel access approaches, a, a focused therapeutic area mindset across five core therapeutic areas, two plus three technology platforms in four priority geographies, and a renewed focus on high-value uh, medicines, not necessarily volume of medicines, but delivering truly high-value medicines, along with the other elements of our strategy on delivering returns and strengthening foundations. And translating that into this year's priorities onto slide 29, um, we continue to maintain our growth momentum and we confirm our 2022 guidance. Our top 22 priorities remain on track across launches and growth momentum on our uh, six key brands. The pipeline is progressing per plan. I think the focus strategy, as I mentioned, has been executed against and we're on track with the spin of Sandoz uh, plan for next year. We continue our productivity plans through our new organizational model, delivering $1.5 billion of additional savings. And we continue to strengthen the foundations of the company, culture driving performance, data science to drive value, and working towards ESG leadership. So with that, I will open the line for questions. I would ask that uh, questioners please limit yourself to one question and then we'll try to move through the queue uh, as many rounds as we can in the call. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder to ask a question, you will need to press star one and one on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. Once again, please press star one and one if you would like to ask a question. We will now take our first question, and your first question comes from Graham Parry from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Great. Thanks for taking the question. Um, so it's on to Victo. So very strong launch. Uh, obviously, that's not inventory because you can't uh, build inventory on to Victo. Uh, so I was wondering, actually, has this caused any capacity constraints given you're only supplying from the Italian facility at the moment? Um, and therefore, could we expect actually sales to plateau per quarter until you see new capacity come online. If you could just give us an update on the timing of the New Jersey and Indianapolis plants next year, are they still second quarter in the second half? Uh, anything you can do to bring those online faster? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Graham. So with respect to Pluvecto, we're able to supply the, the U.S. demand across the 150, 125 plus centers now we have currently set up, and we would expect demand growth to continue uh, in quarter four. So we're able to make that supply. What's critical for us is as we move uh, into the period where we hope to have a positive readout in the earlier lines, the PSMA4 study, uh, we would need additional capacity to be able to service that earlier large indication. Right now, we hope to be able to file uh, the Milburn facility back to, to the uh, Pluvicto file before the end of this year and hope to have that online in the first part of next year. And we're on track for the Indianapolis facility to come online in the middle of next year. So once the Milburn facility comes online, we've invested in that facility to have additional capacity. We would be well positioned already for that new indication in the, in the demand search. And then once Indianapolis comes online, we would be in a position where we can service the U.S. from two manufacturing plants in the U.S., dedicate our European facilities to Europe and ex-U.S., uh, and then look at adding additional capacity in Asia and other markets over time. Thank you, Graham. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Vimal Kapadia from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, great. Thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, can I just ask about Zolgensma, please? Uh, so some of your commentary uh, you know, now suggests uh, you've penetrated a, a large part of the, the bolus pool and it's really about the incidence population moving forward. I think it's probably fair to say, or please correct me, if not that, that you know, previously the 2 billion peak sales guide X, the interest equal, was a, was a fair estimate. That's you're now saying 1.5 to 2 billion. So I just want to be clear, is that a change in expectations? And particularly given we're going to get close to $1.5 billion this year alone, 
Uh, and then just maybe you mentioned Brazil. Uh, which other key countries and maybe some timing on those countries would be great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So the dynamics on Zilgensma, as you all well know, but just to go through them, is that we, as we add markets, we initially penetrate a bolus of patients in the under two age group, and then we move back to the incident patient population. And in the incident patient population, the demand is driven by expanding newborn screening, particularly outside of the, of the United States. Um, right now, um, the, the key for us is to add those additional markets. So those markets range from Saudi Arabia and Brazil to Turkey and India. So there's a, a number of markets uh, and other markets around the world where we're currently uh, in active negotiation. And our hope is by adding those markets online, we'll, we'll be able to build that overall pool, not only of prevalent patients, which will increase um, sales for, for a period of time, but also build up the base of incident patients who are uh, receiving Zolgensma on an ongoing uh, basis. I think as we now look at the trajectory, we're ranging just because we, it's hard for us to predict exactly as we learn more um, when exactly these markets will come online. So we think it's prudent to say 1.5 to 2. We certainly have the aspiration to get to 2, but it's going to depend on how many more markets we're actually able to get onto national programs. And, of course, our teams are working very hard to do that. We're currently enrolling the intrathecal indication for 2 to 18 year olds, as I mentioned, uh, both to generate additional data for IV, where we do have a broader label in certain markets, including the EU, up to five years of age. So we want to generate additional data for the IV and the pivotal study in 2 to 18 year olds. And we remain on track, we hope, uh, to have that filing in 2024 and then approved in the first part of 2025. And that would give us the momentum to make the, the medicine beyond $2 billion over time, and I think we'll have a better sense of how large it could be depending on the magnitude of the effect we see in those indications. Thanks for the question, Thank Wilma. You. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Richard Park, EMP Pariba. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, just a question on Itacapan and PNH. You've outlined the data for us on measures of extravascular hemolysis, but I wondered if you could give us any indication on how data on measures of intravascular hemolysis, such as LDH and rate of breakthrough hemolysis, were trending. I know you'll present the data, but I'm just wondering if you've got confidence there's at least no deterioration in those measures when switching from standard of care. And maybe you could just give us a sense of how you think about the launch uptake in that indication, given we have standard of care with long-term outcomes data beyond um, control of anemia. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Richard. So, so first, I think it's worth remembering that in phase 2B, as um, in the phase 2B data sets for Taclopan, and Taclopan demonstrated strong LDH lowering and a very favorable safety profile, also, also with respect to breakthrough hemolysis. Uh, given that we are in the midst of uh, uh, filing this data uh, or, or uh, submitting this data for Congress is I don't want to you know update on the secondary endpoints we'll present all of that as soon as possible at an upcoming medical meeting but we feel very confident about the overall safety profile of Iptacopan with respect to the various uh, other elements that one would want to measure across intravascular and extravascular um, hemolysis. Importantly as well, what will be important is an upcoming data set in the, in the frontline setting in treatment naive patients to demonstrate that the profile holds up. Taken together, based on everything that we've seen thus far, we our aspiration remains to be a medicine that can be used in naive patients in patients, uh, to switch patients off of anti-C5s uh, onto what we believe could be a bet more beneficial therapy, and then if, if desired, can also be used as an add-on therapy to really cover the full range of potential indications um, with this medicine, a twice-a-day oral medicine that we think can be you know, really an attractive option, not only in the U.S., but also when you consider that half of the PNH market and uh, is currently an ex-U.S. market a twice-a-day oral could be highly, highly attractive. Um, so all things to, to work through. We look forward to presenting the data in more detail uh, at, uh, shortly. Thanks, Richard. Thank you. Next question, operator. Thank you. 
Your next question comes from the line of Emmanuel Papadakis from Deutsche Bank. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you for taking the question. Perhaps I could take one on Lectio. Uh, we don't seem to see much of an impact from the 1st of July J-Code award. So just your latest perspective on uh, how things are trending and what confidence and what actually drives that mid-23 inflection. Is there something that, in your view, is going to catalyze a step change in the middle of next year, or is it more really a build through the course of 2023 and new confidence that we'll still get to blockbuster status pre-outcomes later in 26? Many thanks. Yeah, thanks, Emmanuel. Um, the, the key here is to get enough physicians who have gone through the process of getting a patient on therapy, um, both then seeing the LDL reduction after the first and second dose, second dose is at, at, three month, at the three-month time point, and having successfully been reimbursed in the Part B uh, program. When those things happen, we see physicians, 80% plus of physicians, at least that we've internally surveyed, um, have a positive experience both from a clinical standpoint and from a Part B reimbursement standpoint, regardless of whether they used an alternative injection center or used their own clinic. So that's all the positive um, positive data that we have. But we need to move physicians through that process. So the reason we highlight 4,000 physicians now have initiated shows that we have that kind of, uh, in the early part of the funnel, physicians moving through the process. They've probably trialed a few patients. We now have to get them through that entire process, and if they presumably have that positive overall experience, they will add additional patients onto the therapy. And so this is going to be a build, but as we build that base, we hope then to convert entire practices over to using Lecvio over time, and that would hopefully then lead to a compounding effect and, and an acceleration. Um, overall, we remain confident that we will get to the blockbuster status ahead of outcomes data. That, that's for certain. And, and a lot of work to do, but it absolutely remains our, our goal. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Matthew Weston, Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thanks very much. I'm going to follow on with Emmanuel's question, again, touching on, on Lecvio. So, Ras, as you pointed out, the a marked inflection not until 18 months into launch. As I recall going back to Diavan and Entresto, I thought they took four years to break even as products. And now we have the risk of the IRA potentially limiting small molecule life to nine years. Can you just lay out whether or not you feel that Lecvio will break even before that four-year level we saw with large cardiovascular medicines? And if so, why? And then I guess the other question is whether, having invested so heavily in buy and bill, are there other cardiovascular assets that you hope to bring on board or have in the pipeline that you can put through the similar channel to give doctors the comfort that investing in all the practice infrastructure isn't just a single product with Lecvio, but there's a stream of products that they can capitalize on? Yes, thanks, Matthew. So first on the on the payback period, I'll have Harry comment, and I'll come back in the second part of your question. Hi, Matthew. You know, I think we, you know, as we discussed before, um, these cardiovascular launches are, in my in my experience, like GP primary care launches. I mean, of course, all of them are different depending on the product and the category and so on. But in my experience, usually then the the uh, break even. It happens roughly in year four, plus minus. Why it's, of course, high price specialty launches, you know, sometimes have a break even year one or at least in year two. So clearly, uh, nine years versus 13 years is, is not a positive, right? That's why I think also there will be initiatives uh, to move those two um, closer to the 13 years, both of them. But at the moment, it's nine years. Uh, but, of course, in any of these launches, one wants to have the uptake to be as fast as possible, just cardiovascular is slow, and I would expect then um, usually break even year four. Now, I think, Matthew, in terms of having – it is on our mind to build a broader portfolio of medicine. So both uh, in-house, we have efforts ongoing, both in terms of life, life, life cycle management – of Lecvio, as well as uh, other novel therapeutics, which are still moving through the, the research uh, pathway or, or research labs to try to accelerate now to make sure we have a stream of medicines. I also say broadly in the industry, there are other medicines as well that I think could also fit in terms into the, the buy and bill model. 
But on a standalone basis, for most practices that we've analyzed, uh, the number of cholesterol patients in a practice, it is uh, favorable for cardiologists once they have this set up and have it moving to do it just for Lecbio. So I think it's an important point that it's not a requirement that you have multiple medicines, even this one medicine alone, where you have also the certainty that you know the patient is on therapy, you see the result on the cholesterol lowering, it's highly attractive from that point clinically, and also the practice has the cost reimbursement elements as well, uh, is pretty attractive, we find, with most practices that have gone through the process. So we'll not only focus on life video, but also build a pipeline uh, behind it. And as Harry mentioned, I think a top priority has to be to ensure small molecules and related technologies are not penalized relative to large molecules. So that, of course, will take time to shape public policy. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Simon Baker, Redburn. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, and, and at the risk of being boring, I'm going to follow Matthew and Emmanuel on, on Lecvio. Um, uh, Faz, just go on this, your uh, expectation of a linear trend uh, to the middle of next year. With, with the two drivers of more doctors being set up um, to administer the drug and more patients per physician, I mean, that does sound a little conservative because, I mean, that in itself um, should, if both of those are increasing, that should drive more than linear growth. So just try to understand a little bit more about that. And, and also related to that, um, you are running a DTC campaign um, with two adverts at the moment in the US um, for Lecvio. Do you have any sense of, of how patient demand is exceeding the billing capabilities of physicians at the moment? Not, so it's not really a case of, of, of uh, unfilled scripts, but, but uh, unsatisfied patient demand. Is there any, you, any indication you can give us on, on that? Thanks so much. Yes, I mean, I think on the, on the first question, um, I think it's just we've learned over the years it's prudent on cardiovascular launches to be uh, appropriately cautious until we see evidence that in the sales line um, we see a trend break. And I think at the moment uh, all of the uh, inputs look, look positive, as you say. We have a number of physicians that we have that have initiated some action on LECVO, the feedback we get from physicians going through the process, uh, we're starting to see improvements, though we'd like to see more improvements in depth for practice that are, are on, um, that are using LecVio already. Uh, so all of the things are in the right direction. Reimbursement is at higher levels than PCSK9s achieved in year five. Uh, we've said high levels of patients don't have to pay any copay to access the medicine. So again, all in the right direction. But I think we would feel better if we actually saw uh, a trend break before we start promising uh, anything bigger than a, a linear trend. So that's kind of our mindset at the moment. And if it happens, that would be terrific. And we would, of course, uh, share that with all of you as soon as, as soon as it does. We do have a very active um, DTC campaign to activate patients on the benefits of a twice-a-year therapy that can deliver up to 60% lowering on LDL cholesterol. And we do see the beginnings of increased uh, patient demand. I would note that, um, actually, we don't see capacity as an issue because we are able to use the AIC networks, which are continuing to expand to absorb any excess patient volume. So if, if a practice is not able to set up buy and bill immediately, we're able to in, uh, educate practices about AICs, which are available in the community that are, are, are set up and we've worked very closely with that expanding network of alternative injection centers um, to make LecVio available. One of the things we've learned that we need to get much smoother at is that transition of helping a practice then send the patient to the AIC and then back to the practice. We're working on smoothing that out. But that AIC creates a pretty big surge capacity. Uh, but what we do hear from practices in general is over time they would like to set up the buy and build capacity within their own practice. It's just a matter of can they do that immediately, or would they like to do that in the future? Great. Thanks, Thanks Simon. Much. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Tim Anderson, Wolf Research. Please go ahead. Hi, this is Richard Wagner uh, on behalf of uh, Tim with Wolf Research. Uh, thanks for the question. It's about uh, Cosentix. And could we get an update on the competitive landscape in the U.S.? 
as AbbVie works to lock in formulary positioning for its various I and I products in 2023 onwards as Humira Biosimilars approach? Uh, what would be the impact or could be the impact on net pricing and formulary placement? Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Richard. Now, when you look at uh, Cosentix, we're still in the midst of the formulary negotiations at this time, but our our best belief and indication, given that formularies want to have an IL-17A on available for patients, that we'll be able to maintain our formulary position at roughly equivalent position in terms of our gross to nets as we have uh, have this year. I think looking forward, what will be absolutely critical for us to continue Cosentix growth dynamics and really uh, maximize the medicine is the approval of additional indications um, in hydroadenitis. We have the IV indication as well. As I mentioned, we plan to file. We have a 2ML syringe, which we are also in the midst of filing. Those would be the next big three. And then beyond that, indications, as I mentioned, giant cell arteritis, tendonitis, uh, amongst others. That's going to be the next wave we're going to need to maintain strong position on formularies, but also to enable the brand to continue to, to grow. But for 2023, uh, based on our negotiations to date and reviews we've had with our managed markets teams, we feel comfortable with where we'll be on formularies for, for next year. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Stephen Scala from Cowan. Please go ahead. Well, thank you so much. Uh, first, an observation, then a question. So the observation is that in response to the Plavicto question, it makes it sound as though Q4 sales will be appreciably above Q3, and I guess you must have some visibility since Q4 is uh, about a third over already. Uh, the question is, Voss, in the past you have been cautious on the use of A-beta antibodies for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Given recent news, do you have any reason to change your view? And if yes, then how will Novartis gain a position in A-beta antibodies or some other approach in Alzheimer's? Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Steve. On, on A-beta um, antibodies, um, I think what's most important, particularly given the amount of investment that would need to be made by healthcare systems um, for therapies, and we, of course, are active in Alzheimer's disease research, is, is the benefit that we're seeing not only statistically significant but clinically meaningful. Um, and I think with the, um, the, the various measures that are currently used, it's, it's hard to judge what is clinically meaningful ultimately for a patient. Um, and I think that's going to be the question for payers, advisors, et cetera, um, in the U.S. markets. Um, is, this, is this clinically meaningful enough, a very, uh, the, the point of 4, 0.45 or whatever the number is, um, on the ATIS, uh, ACOG uh, scores. So, you know, I think we'll have to see. That'll be for others to judge. Our focus is on other mechanisms of action. I mean, we think uh, we don't know, what, but certainly our labs are working on other approaches across the full range of neurodegenerative diseases um, where we have programs in the clinic, as you know, on Huntington's and Parkinson's and continue to also look at uh, various targets in Alzheimer's, but I wouldn't expect us to take any action on A beta. None of the data that I've seen thus far would trigger us to, to make a shift at this point in time. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Kerry Holford from Berenberg. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Question um, for Harry. Um, just looking at the UNR 844 termination, that product that you acquired by the NCOR vision acquisition, was there an asset impairment taken in the quarter? And if not, is that coming next quarter? I wonder if you can quantify how big that might be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Kerry. Actually, the majority of our impairment recorded in quarter three was UNR, you know, the uh, potential presbyopia drops of roughly a net impact of half a billion. So we immediately, when we stop a program, we immediately book it. Right? So that has happened in quarter three. Great. Thank you, Kerry. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Richard Foster, J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Uh, maybe we could uh, talk about Natalie and uh, 
Maybe you could uh, give us a, a, an update where uh, we are in terms of uh, the interim analyses. Uh, is it still the case that uh, the 70% interim should be expected at the end of the year? And then, of course, the final uh, analysis are in the second half of next year. Um, just some, some thoughts there would be great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Richard. So we continue to expect the first interim to read out before the end of this year, but we have not heard back from the, the DMC at this point in time. And our, our approach will be that if the DMC advises us to make a change, we'll let the markets know. And if we don't hear from us, that means the DMC told us that the study should continue as planned. We expect the um, second interim to happen in the first half of next year, and the final study should complete uh, at the second half of, of next year. Another study that also often, another question that often comes up is related to how we'll approach OS in these various settings. And the FDA has confirmed to us that as long as there is no detriment to OS at any of these time points, that would be sufficient for them to consider the data set as pivotal uh, for a potential uh, approval. Thanks, Thanks Richard. Well. Next question. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of. Emily Field from Barclays, please go ahead, your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, uh, just uh, um, MS, um, on Gelenia, I know your prior guidance assumed no launches in the U.S., um, so good to maintain that. Um, just it, the impact on uh, core operating margin, should we think of that as a pretty straight drop down, given that it's probably a pretty high margin product? Um, and then just, um, Kacinta, um, your uh, share assumptions in the class going forward, do you expect those to be impacted by the potential launch of a subcutaneous Ocarus? Thank you. So, so first on Jelania, Harry. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Yeah, it is a very high margin. It's a very high mar gross margin product. There's a, some royalty on it, but it's, of course, also small molecule, high priced. So the... Um, the product margin is quite high, uh, as you can imagine. At the end of the life cycle, there is not much MNS on it, so it's pretty much a straight drop down to the bottom line. But of course, we have mitigating actions and productivity plans, and it's fully embedded in our guidance this year. And then, with respect to, to Kasimta, Kasimta um, has really been successful as a first line, first switch medicine in the neurology settings that are not currently participating uh, in infusions, as infusions, uh, that, as, as is the case with our competitor product. I think first we need to see if a um, sub high dose sub Q can be delivered without uh, any sort of reactions and other complications. I don't think that's a, a given. I mean, of course, data will have to bear that out. And then it's worth remembering our positioning will be for patients who want a monthly injection at home and don't want to go into uh, the infusion center. Um, clearly, the sub-Q might reduce the time of the infusion center, but it remains to be seen how will steroid pretreatment need to be happen, happen? Does it, will it need to be continued to be IV, Can it, is it su sufficient for it to be oral, what kind of monitoring requirements FDA will require. So I think uh, it still remains that there is a segment of the market that will want to use uh, IV infusion or sub-Q infusion uh, therapies, and there's a segment where Novartis and Kasimta we hope to become uh, the clear leader amongst patients, first class, uh, first treatment or first switch, who want a, a very convenient at home, highly safe, high efficacious B cell therapy, and that's our focus. Uh, and Harry has a point. Yeah, just uh, Emily, uh, a follow on clarification also on uh, Jalenia. You know, I mentioned that this is fully in our guidance for 2022. And I just want to mention also that this has no impact on our mid- to long-term guidance. You know, we, uh, prior to this uh, turn of the U.S. courts, if you will, um, we were expecting to lose U.S. Uh, uh, exclusivity, if you will, or have generic entries in, in the middle of 24, roughly. Right From that standpoint, our 40% plus uh, margin um, goal in 2027 plus uh, was already fully assuming that uh, generics would have entered uh, several years before that. Great. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Harry. And so we, we still have a number of questions in the queue. If we could just remind everyone to ask one question per, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Next question, operator. Thank you. 
Your next question comes from the line of Kea Parekh from Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thank you for taking my questions. Um, first, you mentioned that you would like for Tecopan to be the therapy of choice, kind of in the frontline setting. What data do you think you would need to see kind of from the frontline study to allow for Tecopan to be in that position, given the head start that the election products uh, already have in that market? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kara. I think what will be important is if we can demonstrate we uh, can generate clear control of, of the disease and, of course, ac across the various parameters, LDH, safety, et cetera, that we have a, a compelling profile. I think when you look broadly, first, if you think first principles, the biology of this disease, this is an alternative complement pathway-driven disease. And factor B is a relatively unique component of this in that it's um, – not as abundant as C3 and C5, and an oral agent can get to both the extravascular and intravascular sources of a factor B and inhibit those. And those include uh, tissues that go beyond the liver, which is important consideration when you consider ASOs and siRNAs. And oral therapy presents a unique profile in being able to reach the full broad range of, of tissues. Um, so overall, we think factor B for these uh, these alternative complement-driven diseases, including PNH, is a, a ideal target. And overall, the PKPD we see for this medicine, the preclinical and clinical safety we see, has been very good. That's been borne out now in the apply uh, PNH study that we've already headlined, uh, and we hope to continue to see that in the frontline study and then next year in C3G in particular, but also in IGAN. And then in other alternative complement pathway-driven diseases, including AHUS, cold gluten disease, MCPGN. So there's a range of diseases where we believe the medicine is well-suited, and I think we're excited that the medicine has, so far in its first pivotal readout, uh, borne out the clinical and preclinical hypotheses that we set forward. So we'll look forward to providing the data uh, in an upcoming Medical Congress, as I outlined, and then the, the second study as well we'll read out before the end of this year. Thank you, Kara. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Purcell from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Uh, first, just returning to Natalie, the interim analysis, is that based on all comers, or do you need to see a significant benefit specifically in the intermediate risk patients, which may be, I guess, as, as, as low as 25, 30% of the events? Thanks very much. Yeah, so, um, Mark, I think uh, it's important to note that um, we're looking at both um, grade, grade two, grade three uh, um, patients uh, in the study, and the way we're powered is across the entire population. Uh, and we've re-looked at that powering many times now, and we feel very comfortable based on the, the study uh, the study design and what we've seen from other competitors and the fact that we powered up by a 1,000 additional patients. Uh, and so the, the results, the IDFS results, will be based on the overall population, and that's how the endpoints are designed. As a separate point, uh, and just to be clear, the FDA can at any point in time decide that they want to take cuts between stage two and stage three patients, uh, but our focus for our primary analysis is stage 2A, stage 2B, and stage 3 patients as defined in the protocol, and the endpoint will be driven off of all, that entire patient population. That's very clear. Thank you. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Seamus Fernandez, Guggenheim Securities. Please go ahead. Oh, thanks for the question. So, um, I guess one quick question just to, uh, on Lectio. Um, can you just uh, help us understand where those patients are coming from? Are they predominantly switch patients from existing PCSK9 therapy, um, or is this, you know, a, a new patient pool? And then just very quickly, second question, Buzz, as we look towards, you know, potential business development becoming uh, increasingly critical um, as the years progress, uh, just wondering where your particular focus is, um, given the commentary around primary care uh, cardiovascular product launches um, and and the, uh, the 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 ability to launch into those efficiently. Thanks. Yes, uh, thanks, Seamus. So first, on on Lectio's source of business, just as a reminder, 
Um, the target patient population in the U.S. is 18 million patients, and across all of the core markets, EU plus the top markets around the world, is around 70 million patients. These are patients who have had a prior a cardiovascular event and are not reaching 70 milligrams per deciliter on their um, LDL uh, score, and, and that is the guideline directed. That is that is the goal. Um, so it's a big, big patient population. Right now, I think what we can say is that the primary uh, prescribers that we see are, pay, are prescribers who also have experience with PCS, PCSK9 mon monoclonal antibodies. That could be low experience. It could be high experience. Uh, harder for us to say, given that this is a Part B medicine, the source of business from a patient standpoint, but I presume then we're either getting switch patients on PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies or we're at least getting a broader share of physicians that are open to the PCSK9 class. And so our focus right now is to really say how can we get broad adoption within, let's call it, PCSK9-minded physicians. And then over time, try to expand further and further through our work with uh, systems of care, population health agreements, et cetera, into the broader patient population of 18 million patients. Um, clearly, we don't need a, that big a share of that 18 million patients to reach our overall financial goals. From a public health standpoint, we would, of course, want to reach as many of those patients as possible because right now, the odds of a patient having a subsequent event go up quite dramatically if they're not at that 70 goal. So that's kind of overall how we approach it. There's no updates with respect to M&A and BD. We continue to focus on, uh, let's call them sub-3, $4 billion M&A deals, a broad range of licensing opportunities, uh, focus primarily on science and does the science work? Is it fitting in our core therapeutic areas? Does it fit in our 2 plus 3 technology areas as we've outlined at the Meet the Management? And we continue to assess, and if, if we find something that's attractive where we have a differentiated view that would justify the premium and generate, we believe, value creation for our shareholders, we'll, of course, pursue it. Um, other than that, we're also willing to be patient. We believe in our pipeline. We believe with our new leadership within R&D and the addition of a strategy and growth officer, we can unlock the full potential of Novartis research and development. Uh, and then have a steady stream of medicines going forward. And so we're going to remain disciplined as we as we move ahead. Um, next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Florence Postedes from Society General. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking my question. A quick one on China, please. Um, as China is a key country for you, uh, could you please elaborate on the dynamic there for your key products uh, and if there is any, uh, let's say, impact from lockdown? And uh, could you refresh our memories and uh, please uh, remind us the current contribution and your ambition on this country? Thank you. Yeah, with respect, thanks, Laurent. For, for China, we've outlined uh, our aspiration to become a top three player by, by 2024, which would be a player that exceeds $4 billion in sales in the market. We've had really a record performance in terms of uh, number of approvals over recent years, and then also moving forward, I think we lead the industry as well in terms of NRDL listings. Um, key drivers for us has been our oncology portfolio, Entresto, Cosentix, uh, Lucentis, um, amongst amongst others. Um, now, we were growing in uh, the high teens from a sales growth standpoint before uh, the lockdowns, and I think in the lockdowns, now we continue to grow, but we're growing more in the high single-digit um, uh, frame at the moment. Uh, and we would expect that to continue until we would see a, a shift in the overall ability for patients to access medical care in more normal dynamics. Um, that's part of the reason why you see uh, the slowdown in Cosentix uh, that we saw. Uh, with Entresto, given the strength of our overall performance globally, it doesn't really move the needle on that particular brand. Uh, so the key brand where it has an impact is, is Cosentix and to a smaller extent on some of the other, other brands. Nonetheless, we continue to believe, given that there's over a billion patients, a uh, billion people we can serve with our portfolio of medicines, we have to continue to uh, find ways to um, continue to reach patients in the framework that is currently in place, and then also be ready that if there's a further opening up to continue to expand our, our growth in, in the market. 
And importantly, we believe Lectio uh, and some of our other medicines, Pluvicto, Lectio, amongst others, could be significant medicines in China over time. Next question, operator. Thank you. For Thank you very much. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Andrew Baum from City. Please go ahead. Thank you. A question on um, the IRA impact on catastrophic coverage and the burden on PBMs and managed care. Um, a significant part of Kiskali goes through the Medicare channel. Um, Ibrant is seen to be available at a much lower price post genericization. So, what extent do you, to, to what extent, excuse me, do you see deflation of the price of Kiskali within the Medicare segment because there'll be prioritization step edits within Medicare prior to gaining access to Kiskali? And do you see any risk of spillover of that, assuming that thesis is correct, to the commercial book of business? Many thanks. That's a good question, Andrew. Um, I think in general, I'd say, you know, we're doing a lot of scenario planning on how um, the IRA um, could impact various brands. And I think certainly on our minds is how the increased exposure of PBMs in the catastrophic, how that will get tr uh, transferred or translated into actions against um, some of our medicines. Um, I think the key for us to differentiate versus a generic in a class like a C in the CDK 4.6 will be having a broader indication, set of indications relative um, to the existing medicine. Um, so I think that's going to be absolutely critical for us in this uh, in this class to hopefully have the opportunity to expand into, as I mentioned um, earlier, stage 2A, stage 2B, and stage 3 um, patients. Otherwise, there, I think there could certainly be spillover um, from in the metastatic setting, um, if there aren't broad indications, um, you know, for the for the other two players, so we'll have to see how this how this plays out. I would also say, in general, in some of these cancer classes, such as the CDK46, you do see contracting, and you do see the opportunity for uh, commercial insurers to to get rebates from branded products. So that would be the I think tension there in the system is they would have to give up their commercial rebates to potentially um, utilize the generic. So we'll have to see ultimately how all of this uh, all of this plays out. Thank you, Andrew. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Peter Welford from Jefferies. Please go ahead, your line is open. Oh, hi, thank you. I just wanted to return to Pluvicto. Um, I wonder if you'd give us any more color at all in the centers that are currently using it. Are these generally uh, academic centers and are these generally centers um, that are using via the radiation oncologist or is it more nuclear medicine physicians? Uh, and particularly with regards to then the diagnostic, uh, just wondering, um, is it largely used, using your own locomets or are you seeing use of other uh, diagnostics before treatment? And is that potentially a source of revenue for you in the future, the diagnostic, or should we think of this um, as largely a wash for the Vartis with the focus being the therapy? Yeah, thanks, Peter. Um, overall, I'd say it's a mix. Um, you have high academic centers. You also have um, large-scale centers, which are, in the case of prostate cancer, a combination of urology uh, and nuclear medicine working in, in conjunction with medical oncology. We see that in some very large centers. Uh, and then we also see some nuclear radiology as well. Um, and, that's, and we generally are focused right now on, on larger volume centers in this first phase of launch. Um, I would note that if we, if we were able to open it up even further in terms of the number of centers, we would expect even higher volumes for this medicine given the overall demand that, that we're seeing. But we're taking it stepwise, making sure we can service this first level of centers absolutely fully, and now we're in the process of adding additional centers step by step. So it's a very different situation than with Lutathera, where because of the lower volumes and also um, neuroendocrine tumors being treated by certain specialists, it was a very limit, relatively limited number of centers that were interested. Whereas here we have more demand from centers, and then within the centers we're in very high demand that, that we're seeing at the moment. So um, those are all the dynamics we're seeing. Uh, overall, I would say from a diagnostic standpoint, there is, a, of course, a preference for gallium, though um, we do see other pet, um, uh, pet ligands also used. Uh, we wouldn't view our locomets 
business as a driver for Novartis um, or something that can materially impact. It's kind of, as you said, kind of a wash. It's much more about identifying patients. One of the dynamics, however, that's very important to understand as you think about Pluvicto in across all lines of metastatic prostate cancer uh, with the PSMA4 study that uh, still needs to read out is the broadening use of PET imaging for identifying patients who have an elevated PSA and to determine the extent of the metastases for, for their cancer. Um, that is a dynamic that works very much in the favor of Pluvicto because if you identify pet, uh, you know, these patients through um, the PET ligand, you're more likely to use a radio ligand because you've seen the tumor and now you know the therapy can target what you see. And that's, I think, an important dynamic for the brand in the longer run. Please switch to the backup feed. Please continue to stand by. Please continue to stand by. Your conference will resume shortly. Please continue to stand by. Your conference will resume shortly. Please continue to stand by. Your conference will resume shortly. Hello again. You are now live again. Yes. Sorry. I don't know what's going on today. Uh, next question, operator. Thank you. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Vimal Kapadia from Bernstein. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Oh, great. Thank you uh, for, the, for the second question. Uh, Vas, uh, you, you mentioned oral being quite important for Iptecopan. So I'm just curious how you think about the issue of adherence with an oral therapy in the real world setting. And then maybe, you know, you could talk here about the, the, the potential for a breakthrough hemolysis. Uh, as a result of potentially lower adherence. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Wamal. I mean, I think there's a, a couple of topics that we'll have to we'll have to work through. So there's always the risk of, of compliance and how we manage that. Um, we can certainly share, as we have more data, the experience we have in clinical in the, in the controlled clinical trial setting. And as I mentioned earlier, we're we're confident in the profile we see with respect to to breakthrough hemolysis. I, mean, I think for many patients, having either regular infusions, weekly infusions, um, biweekly, sub-Q infusions, all of these are, are quite quite burdensome. And at least our experience has been in severe diseases that patients are highly compliant with their oral therapies, given that they know these are absolutely critical for their health and, and well-being. So we believe that the, the compliance topic can be handled in a ultra-rare uh, population that is extremely well-informed about their condition and, of course, will take the steps necessary, and that the benefits of what we believe and hope the clinical trial data will ultimately bear out is improved efficacy, improved safety, improved overall control, uh, improved uh, secondary endpoints um, to be highlighted uh, in, the, in the upcoming uh, disclosures will motivate patients to, to want to get on the, the best therapy for the management of their disease. And that's, I think, the case we'll have to make. Alongside that, of course, comes up the question on, on if you're competing against Part B medicines, uh, how, how will that impact? Um, our assessment is that, in general, most of the hematologists who use this medicine are very low volume with respect to given that there's only four to 6,000 patients in the U.S., uh, and that can be managed given that this is likely not a large cost recovery driver for those physicians. 
Outside of the U.S., we would expect our ability to use an oral therapy to reduce the burden on healthcare systems, as well as hopefully reach many of the patients who can't afford the currently approved therapies, would allow us to, again, treat the, the majority, I, I hope, the majority of patients with these complement-driven diseases, including TNH, over time. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mual. Next question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Graham Parry, Bank of America. Please go ahead. Uh, great. Thanks for the follow-up. Um, so just following again on for Victor, just to reiterate on Steve's point. So um, are you at capacity now, though, in Q3, or should fourth quarter be higher than third quarter before you bring on next uh, level of supply? And then in the pre-tax aim setting, can you help us understand um, the, the, the proportion of patients in that first line metastatic indication that go through uh, a large center such as the ones you're targeting at the moment versus community oncology and community urology centers. And on that last group, how do you stop them from just using taxane up front anyway? Because if they refer a patient, they'll essentially lose the income from that patient at least for the treatment portion of the disease. Um, and then just lastly, a question we've had a few times this morning, um, just why the conservatism in the guidance if uh, innovative medicines is growing mid to high single digits um, and uh, Sandals also now growing. You've, you've upgraded Sandals twice now without upgrading the, uh, the group guidance. So just uh, what's sort of the difference, the bridge between IM mid to high and, uh, and uh, then group guidance still only at mid. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Graham. First, on, on supply, to, to reiterate, we have adequate supply to meet the demand um, for the uh, post-taxane vision population for Pluvicto. We see very high levels of demand, and we expect continued growth of the brand in the coming quarters in that third, fourth line, third, fourth line setting, and we allocate all capacity that is available in our network to the United States launch. Uh, if anything, we'll, if we needed, we would uh, prioritize launches in other markets to assume that the, to ensure that the U.S. is at, at full full demand. Um, I guess what I was trying to indicate is we even even uh, with respect to the higher demand and higher volumes we expect to see in quarter four, those volumes could be even higher if we were to completely unconstrain the number of centers that would want to bring this medicine on board. Um, so all, all on the right trajectory. Um, with respect to the pre-tax staying setting, we, we would roughly expect uh, the new data, if positive, to triple to quadruple the number of patients that would be eligible for, so basically the broad range of uh, patients in the metastatic setting, um, first, second, third line, but all, all the full range of metastatic prostate cancer patients who have, the key constrainer who is have a PET scan. So once they have a PET scan, we would expect them to be eligible um, for, for our medicine. I think it's much more of PET scan availability that will drive a lot of their the movement towards radioligand therapy, perhaps versus tax, the tax names or other, other available um, thera therapeutics. Um, and I, I guess what, what I'd say is it's really going to be in terms of referral patterns from community oncology to larger centers. Two dynamics there. One, how fast can we move out? Because we believe that if we get to 400 or so centers, we can cover the full range of so the population, so the accessibility would be there. Um, and then, and then, second, the quality of the data, so that physicians feel compelled to refer, even if there's a risk that the, the patient is moved to another center. Because I think, in general, oncologists want what's best for their patients in, in all cases, and so I think that's going to be the other part of, of the story. For more specific data, let us come back to you. We have to probably do some more work in terms of the specifics of community oncology versus large-scale uh, senators, centers and where the patients are in that uh, broad metastatic population. In terms of the guidance, Harry? Yeah, hi, Trey. I um, was been expecting that question, of course. But I would say, you know, we are guiding for the total company uh, mid-single digit, top line and bottom line on our core sales and core bank. We have delivered on the company for the first nine months, five and six percent. And I expect without getting into a very detailed quarter four guidance that we are roughly in that range again, you know, in, in quarter four. But of course, you have to take into account um, that U.S. Jelenia now has a generic entry. So maybe the top line a little bit less than the year to date, but uh, a good 
you know, mid to high single digit on the bottom line. So overall, I think you see on the first nine months that we are very much on track for the guidance. If it's a little bit stronger on the bottom line, so be it. But I think it is um, roughly in line with what you have seen so far. <clears throat> Thanks, Ram. Next uh, question, operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Matthew Weston, Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you. It's a simple question for Harry on tax. Obviously, you've changed guidance for full year 22 with a reduced tax rate, and you highlighted the change in geographic mix. Harry, I wondered if that new lower tax rate is the best indication for 2023, or whether or not you see any meaningful changes that mean it's not a good indicator for the midterm. Go ahead, Harry. Yeah. Thank you, Matthew. So, Overall, there is always a bit of volatility on the geographic uh, profit mix, right? we, and then we adjust, if you will, to each quarter to what we believe is our full year estimate on the core and reported taxes. So basically, uh, we moved our full year estimate from 16.9% as we had in the first six months to 16.5%. Now, I would, exp again, we give detailed guidance of course, for 23, then when we have our full year results uh, in January or early February, actually, and uh, then, but I would expect the tax rate to be in that range of 16 and a half to 17 and a half. We will update you um, with that then uh, early February. Next question, Thank operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Kerry Holford, Berenberg. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Thank you. Uh, a follow-up question on Prevec Co, please. Just looking at slide 33, it highlights a change to your approach in the non-metastatic setting. So could you confirm why you're now moving to start phase two next year rather than a phase three this year? just clarify those changes and perhaps the opportunity in that setting as well, please. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, thanks Gary. In the, in the non-metastatic setting, the way our previous study was designed and based on feedback from um, the uh, various investigators and the FDA, we believe the PSMA4 study covers the population that we had previously believed we needed to do an additional study uh, for. So we redesigned our program to generate additional data in a, in a different, I don't have the details at hand, but a different population within the, the non-metastatic setting. I would also say we're evaluating now Pluvicto as well in earlier lines of, of therapy to see if we can delay progression, uh, as well as evaluating combination therapies as well, given the um, overall interest we've seen on the medicine and the clinical profile that, that we're seeing. So that's the reason we made that switch based on the um, uh, understanding from the regulators and, and, and experts in the United States. Next question, operator. Thank you. Please stand by. Your next question comes from the line of Richard Foster, JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Hi, thanks for taking my question. When I look at the latest prescriptions for Tefinlar and Mechanist, um, they seem to have um, gone more into a decline in Q4. Is there anything that we should think about in terms of the dynamics you're seeing in the, in the melanoma market, perhaps lag three approval, uh, impacting uh, those two brands, uh, that we should not think of the, the strong growth we've seen uh, thus far um, continuing beyond uh, for, for the brand. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, thanks, um, thanks, Richard. I mean, overall, I think we, we didn't note any significant change, or at least wasn't flagged to us, any significant competitive uh, issues with respect to TAFMEC um, in the U.S. or in our other uh, key markets. But I think it's a good question, and let us do some homework and, and get back to you. I don't think we have the answers uh, straight at hand. Cool, Next thank question, you. operator. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mark Purcell from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Your line is open. Yeah, thanks very much for taking my follow-ups. Um, Vaz, could you help us understand the, the scope of the free trial offer 
on Liquivio when it comes to uh, patient initiation and what and how that might influence an uh, increase in ACP adoption. And then secondly, on the interest of LOE in China, what's the latest situation uh, there in terms of your best guess? So on, on uh, the, the free, free trial offer mark, really the idea was to, um, while we already um, provide payment terms that allow physicians to stock doses and um, uh, have time to get reimbursed before they would have to ultimately pay for the doses, uh, we also noted that for some physicians there was a need to provide an alternative option to get them comfortable to start to stock the medicine. So in July, we roll out a free trial offer program that provides um, dose, first dose for a patient um, free, and then uh, so the, patient, the physician can get comfortable, use the, those doses, and then hopefully then um, pull through to follow, keep the patient on therapy as they also get comfortable with the buy and bill process. We've had very strong uptake of that program, um, and so uh, I think over a thousand physicians plus have signed up for the free trial offer program at the last look, which was still a month ago. So um, that's been a very positive step, I think, to get more physicians to stock Lecpio in the offices so that ultimately um, they can provide it to patients and then hopefully get more comfortable with an ongoing procedure to, to stock the medicine, provide the medicine, and get reimbursement. Now, with respect to um, Entresto in China, we, we currently are continuing um, our discussions with the, with the or our, uh, I guess, war, our litigations with the, uh, in China against the various uh, generics. I mean, at this point in time, uh, we would expect the Entresto to be fully uh, on, on, protected through 23 and 24, and then impacts in 25 and beyond. Um, but that's... Uh, uh, something we'll have to continue to look at it because it's an evolving landscape with respect to data protection uh, and the ongoing litigations that we have in, in the country. So we'll keep you updated accordingly. Thank you. And I believe with that, we've cleared the entire question queue. I want to thank everyone and apologies for the uh, two technical uh, disruptions. Uh, and we'll look forward to, uh, to keeping you up to date uh, over the course of the remainder of this year. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.